Okay, welcome to tonight's Archaeology Cafe. I see a lot of old friends, um, which is great, and I see a lot of new faces tonight, which is just absolutely super. Welcome. With that, I'll introduce our, our guest tonight, Patrick Lyons. <laughs> Patrick's closest to me, so I'm gonna start no. with Patrick. Uh, he's the director of the Arizona State Museum. Sue Zecker is uh, Assistant Professor of Anthropology. Associate. Associate Professor of Anthropology at Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. Got it. This should be a very interesting talk tonight. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to see our uh, video we did, uh, Steve Lexen's talk uh, about three weeks ago in Phoenix for the Phoenix Archaeology Cafe. But he talked about this concept called up upstreaming, which is a tendency in archaeological interpretation to overly map existing um, patterns in Native American life and culture and ethnography back into the past. But at the same time, um, folks from, from the tribal societies are going to say, you archaeologists don't know what you don't know, and we know so much about it if you only ask for us. So this tension between how far you can map back ethnography into the past is the heart of the matter tonight. So I think we'll go ahead and turn things over. All right. Who'd like to start? All right, I'll start. Um, so Patrick and I did brainstorm a little bit, and we changed the way we were going to organize it. Um, we have a variety of topics um, related to engendering the past, including using ethnographic analogy, but other sorts of data as well. And we were going to comment and talk a little bit back and forth about each one of, or one of those topics and then open it up for questions. And if that topic gets exhausted, then we'll move on to the next one. And if we don't get through all of them, we don't get through all of them. Um, we, we organize them in a way that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, and so we'll probably talk sometimes five minutes, sometimes 15, 20 minutes. Um, but then we'll say, you know, do people have questions or, or, or stories to add or comments to add? Because there's a lot here, and I know that there are numerous folks in the audience who have experience that will add to the discussion. So please feel free to, to chat along. It doesn't have to be the two of us up here talking in front of you. Yeah, um, plus I, I thought that this was our chance to do our Sonny and Cher <laughs> right. thing that we've been practicing. <laughs> so. Um, so I think most everybody knows who we are, but um, I work primarily in um, the Zuni and Hopi area and then in the Rio Grande area in the late 1200s and 13 and 1400s. Uh, and so most of my experiences and my information and my knowledge comes from there. Uh, and I am concerned, concerned a great deal with pottery and the way it articulates with gender, the way it articulates with identity, with religion, and all those kinds of social units. Whereas, what's, what would you say your focus is? Well, I would say that uh, in terms of uh, what Doug mentioned, in terms of living people, the, the people who I think of most of the time in terms of pottery production uh, would be Hopi. And um, the archaeology that I'm, mo that I'm most familiar with is uh, that of uh, the Kayanta and, and Hopi areas, and then um, the Salado phenomenon. So, um, with us, you get Arizona and New Mexico. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and and some of our disagreement or some of our differences of opinion potentially comes from those differences, experiences, and different data sets as well. Um, and we're going to focus probably almost entirely, if not exclusively, on pottery? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. We don't care. What else is there? Right, exactly. We don't care about much else. Um, but, <laughs> but if other people want to talk about something else, you can. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about um, can be given or applied to other technologies, baskets, textiles, stone tools, I think um, that's architecture. I think that's true with the, with the outline here, and I think that uh, the the place that um, that we start maybe, uh, if you don't mind, I start. With yeah, that no, one. that's fine. Um, <clears throat> people sometimes ask, well, why do you talk about gender instead of sex? And maybe it goes without saying, and and maybe it doesn't. But uh, we would be remiss if we didn't um, give people an understanding of where we're coming from in terms of the category of gender. Uh, in that. Um, gender being a culturally constructed category as opposed to a biological category. So that we're recognizing that uh, there's not always um, a one-to-one -one relationship between biology and identity um, or the way that someone perceives him or herself or the way uh, a person experiences their life or who they, they are. So um, it, it is a social uh, construct. And it's also the way other people perceive them. Right? That kind of identity is both ways. It's, it's how you perceive yourself, but it's also the identity that people put on you. 
Um, and so you may be born one sex, um, and as you are growing older, there may be a lot of pressure to fit into a specific gender because of that, or- Or you might live in Russia. Or, or you, <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but there, there may be a lot of um, role modeling, even if it's not vocally said, right, that you belong to a certain gender. And so some people may, may have um, third gender, and, and right. we know that at least the, the Pueblo folks do. Again, a lot of our focus will be Pueblos as well. Um, but we know that people have third genders, and when that third gen gender develops, and by third gender I mean people who are biologically one sex but then gendered the other way, and the most common version of that is to be biologically male but gendered female, um, gendered woman. Um, the, and the Zuni man woman. The Zuni the man woman is most pop most famous probably version of that. Um, but there's other places where gender happens and and there's other ways it can potentially articulate in other cultures, like when women, some women hit menopause, or when women hit menopause, if they live long enough to hit menopause, that once you become an infertile female, that potentially that's another kind of gender. Um, it, and it, it opens you up to certain other activities right. that were not previously available and maybe closes you off to others. Yeah, and Kelly Hayes Gilpin has talked a little bit about that in terms of the archeological evidence. Um, and then there's also, in terms of gender constructs, there's a difference between being a third gender um, and having male and female qualities um, or being recognized as maybe being biologically female but having some male qualities as well. And, and that's harder to get our heads around. Um, but you don't have to necessarily be a third gender to have qualities of both sexes. Um, in terms of social qualities, when I'm talking about qualities, not, not biological qualities. And so there's lots of ways to think about gender um, and lots of ways to talk about it. And we know from ethnographic data, both in the Pueblo world and just from around the world, that gender is a mixed bag of behaviors. It doesn't have to be two, but how we get at that archeologically um, is another whole monster. It really is, because if you think about it, we're, uh, what are we most likely to be dealing with in the archaeological record is biological evidence. Right. But you know, there are cases, perhaps, where we have uh, contrasts or interesting combinations, uh, beats, uh, interesting combinations of, say, mortuary offerings and skeletal remains would be one example, perhaps, or other, other kinds of things. But um, I guess what, what uh, Seuss has been getting at is that there, um, there is this difficulty, but we have to always remember that um, th there's this interpretive difficulty, but we have to remember that the, we're, but we're talking about our social roles, really. Right. So what's expected of someone who identifies as or is, or is viewed as uh, a man or a woman or some other category? Right. Um, and, and, well, we can talk. I mean, part of where our analogies or difficulties come from is ethnography. Right. And we know that the modern or the historic or ethno-historic Pueblo people had, or at least the Zuni had, the, had a man-woman, um, and that uh, there may be some differences in gender when you hit menopause. Um, but we, we, can, we get in the trouble of one, whether that's appropriate analogy, but also circular argument, right? You find mm -hmm. a skeleton, it um, may have be somewhat biologically ambiguous. It may seem more male or more female. Which happens. Um, which happens. Um, in fact, what, 20% of skeletons right. are a little bit ambiguous biologically, or it may not be preserved well. And so you look at the artifacts and you say, oh, well, they have a lot of pottery. It must be a female. Um, and, and so this, we get into this trouble of saying, well, these tasks, these activities, these artifacts are female oriented and therefore that's what women did. And oh, we know women did that because look at the evidence. And, and so we have this, this trouble of, of, or this danger of circular arguments. And we also don't know what third genders look like archeologically. Um, we, we don't have a lot of expectation for that. And so if you do find a skeleton and it's a male skeleton, but it has a whole bunch of female artifacts, is that a third gender? Is it a bad identification for the skeleton? Or is it something else? And, um, and so there's, there's two big problems, right? There's dealing with the data itself, and then it's using the analogy and how far we can push, push ethnographic analogy into the past. Right, and I, I'm, I, I think that the next, I, I like the good, the, the, the 
the layout of the topics that you have here, where we, where we get into um, <clears throat> the fact that a lot of these technologies that are, are of interest to us about the past, because they can tell us so much about people, um, that um, it's not sort of one-stop shopping. It's not just one person or necessarily one gender that's involved. Um, but uh, bef before we get to that, I just wanted to point out one of the things. This is when we talk about uh, this concept of upstreaming or not putting too much of the ethnographic present or um, you know the historic period back into prehistory. Um, there are some pretty robust patterns, though. And so, for example, there's a, a mammoth tome out there called Western Indians uh, by uh, Jorgensen that is a good old-fashioned ethnological analysis of the ways that different uh, Western tribes in the United States and northern Mexico, so everywhere west of the Rockies to the Pacific, uh, how um, people basically make all of their crafts and all of their arts, and who does it and under what circumstances. And out of 172 groups in the Western United States, pottery is made by three groups where men predominate. Well, and ethnographically across the world, if you look at pre, pre-market economies, exactly. Um, what is like 80, 80 percent? Something like 82%, that. It's close to, it's, of, yeah. of pottery is made by women. Between eighty and ninety, and and you hit the nail on the head, which is market economy. One of the things that um, ethnoarchaeologists and historians and other people have pointed out about that is once pottery becomes. Uh, um, highly institutionalized in terms of production as a money-making venture on a large scale, men take it away from the women. Or male slaves make it. Or male slaves make it. As in like Rome it. and Britain That's and stuff exactly like that. That's exactly right. And so, but, uh, so that, that leads to two points that I wanna, I wanna point out is, um, one, when we talk about gender, um, and we're not talking just about women, right? And gendering is about talking about men and women. Um, but there's two kind of ways we can approach it, and it's, a, it's easy to start getting bogged down in talking about the individual and talking about the man-woman and talking about how can you tell if this particular individual was a man or a woman. Um, but then there's also the bigger picture of gender roles right. and trying to reconstruct gender roles. And I think that as archaeologists, it is probably a lot easier to get at gender roles, right. or at least the main gender roles, than, individuals. than, to in, the, than any specific individual, that we can look at the patterns. Um, and, and so gender is an aspect of probably everybody's life in the past, whether they called the genders the same way as we did or if they had more or, more or fewer genders. Um, and as archaeologists, that's often what we're getting at is that bigger picture. Um, but on a related note, um, the other aspect that is sometimes part of gendered studies, uh, which it, it seems a little bit weird, but is children and not just who's taking care of the children, but, um, but how children are engendered and when they become gendered. Uh, and that's, uh, a, that's even more difficult to get at. Uh, but that's another aspect of gendered studies is do children become gendered when they hit um, puberty? Um, when does a third gender become identified? Uh, do children get gendered names at a certain age? Are they, are they just flat out told what their gender will be? Um, there are some ethnographic cultures, like, like Samoa, which is the other place that I've worked, where- That's the greater Southwest. Yeah, that's the greater <laughs> Southwest. <laughs> and you know, tropical islands have a lot in common with the desert. Um, but uh, um, there, your gender doesn't really take strong role, strong hold until puberty. And so even though it's a really gendered society and men do these things and women do these things and you will never cross over, that is the way it is. And they, ha they have a third gender and every village has um, what's called the Fafa Fine, it has a third gender. And, and so you know, and they have a se uh, separate tasks and activities that they do. Oddly, when um, a hurricane or a tsunami or something like that happens and the village gets destroyed, all gender roles are gone until the village is rebuilt. It turns out everybody knows how to make a house. It turns out everybody <laughs> knows how to cook. It turns out everybody knows how to make baskets. But a lot of that is because they learn it when they're kids. They learn all the tasks, but then they are, di they are divided and told, no, you only know how to do these tasks. 
Um, and so that's another aspect of how people are engendered um, that we can get at a little bit, but it, that's, that's hard as well. And, and part of uh, the danger there is to, is to make assumptions. Uh, just as it's dangerous to, to push too much of the ethnographic record into the past, it's important to not be ethnocentric. It's important not to right. think, of therm, think of things in terms of how we would necessarily experience them as uh, modern Westerners. Uh, so for example, one of the things that I find really interesting about gendered imagery and um, ritual among U.S. Tekken speakers in the Southwest is that flowers are the dominant male symbol, for example. Yeah. Or butterflies and warfare. And butterflies, and yeah, butterflies and warfare, yeah. It just goes together like peanut butter and yeah, jelly. Exactly. <laughs> it's a perfect combination. They like that. They like the butterflies <laughs> yeah. more. Um, and so, I think it's probably a pretty good spot to stop and see the sort of the general discussion of gender before we move on to the more specific topics of gender and pottery production. Questions, um, things to add to the discussion that we didn't think of or touched upon. There's got to be something. Requests for songs from earlier in our career. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about a third gender. Are we talking about homosexuality? Uh, is, that, is that a component? Or, and if so, you're spoken about a third gender. Is that a combination of male and female homosexuality? Or are those? No, you're not. You're not off base. Um, there. So, when, well, you can add, but I, I'm going to talk first. Go for it. <laughs> um, and if I'm wrong, you can disagree. Um, okay. So first, uh, a third gender. Um, when I say third gender, I'm meaning that there's a third gender that's recognized by that society. So in our society, we have two genders, but then we also have people who are homosexual. And there is an archaeology of sexuality of who's sleeping with who. Um, that's really hard to get at. Uh, <laughs> that's really tough. And so when I'm talking about third gender, yeah, I thought pottery was tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, wow. yeah, there's, there's articles on that. It's, it's tough. It's, that's a tough topic. Um, so different cultures do third genders different ways. Um, some cultures, it is a homosexual relationship. Some cultures, it doesn't matter who you're sleeping with, it matters that all activities are being done in the house. And so you right. could have... It's what your job is. Basically. It matters what your job is. And so um, you could have a mix and match. Um, and that happens in Samoa, actually, that the third gender, some people are sleeping with the same sex, some people are sleeping with the opposite sex. Um, and then some societies have a fourth gender that's recognized. And, some, and it's most common to have just a third, but some also have a fourth gender. And so sexuality can be a component of it, but it's more what your social role is and what, what your, your job, job is. is. Does, that, does that answer your question? Okay. And what did you want to add to that? No, that's, okay. that's what I was going to say. Could you give a concrete example of a third gender? What does somebody do that's distinctive? Well, so well. In, in Samoa, which is the, one, the other case I'm most familiar with, um, because I've, I've lived in that culture, um, they have what's called the fafafine. That is their third gender. And um, fafafine are biological males who m mostly, they take on looking like a woman. But within their culture, they do do some women's tasks. Um, they don't do so many male tasks, but they also have separate tasks that they do. Um, they bring good luck, and they have various ways of bringing good luck to the village. So they have a separate job. That's why every village has to have at least one fafafine. Um, uh, some of them initiate men and women into sexual activities, and so it's the first person you will have sex with is a fafafine. Um, they, nowadays, in modern culture, they do uh, charity work. And so they do public outreach and they teach people and they educate people. Like the one point, um, and this was one of the bizarre moments um, when I first went to Samoa, was there was a number of fafafine, so these are, these are males, um, but they're, they're dressed as women, traditional Samoan women, but they were um, educating on breastfeeding. And so they had <laughs> dolls and they were showing people how to breastfeed properly. Um, because breastfeeding has fallen out in Samoan, and so they're trying to bring it back. And so it's, it's those kinds of activities. So it, if in that case, it's a totally different group of activities in some ways. 
But in some cultures, it really is, this is a biological male, but they're doing female activities. And so it, it's a it's a one-on-one -on -one crossover. Does that answer? Did anything to add? No, I was just gonna say there's a lot of variability, but yeah, there's a lot of variability. Yeah. Um, and another interesting aspect in Samoa is that they do have females who take on male roles, but they do not have a separate name. They're not recognized as a third gender. They're just recognized as being males. I have a question. Yep. Could you be? really specific because what I like is when you give examples of things rather than saying there are a lot of cultures that do this and a lot of cultures do that. Could you go back I don't know specific numbers. No, not numbers, things. Like you talked about the children um, are assigned their, their gender or may create their gender. Could you talk about that more and whatever specifics that you know? Oh, do you want, I've been doing a lot of talking. Do you have any specifics? I mean, I can't, I can keep talking all night. Well, but I, you know, I think that the Samoan example is probably going to give you more to talk about them than I would have with Southwestern. Well, culture. I was also, so I was going to give the Plains example. There you go. Of, um, so um, when children are born, they are, they're gender ambiguous. And um, it is true that most of the, the boys, the males, tend to follow the adult males and so they learn to flint nap and they learn to hunt and the females um, tend to start doing the activities their mothers and their aunts are doing. Um, but that, that's not assigned to them, those activities, and they, they can cross cut so little girls can run around with bow and arrows. Um, but then when they hit puberty, they are assigned their gender. And if you... Uh, if you are a child or, or hitting adolescence and you have dreams about lightning and thunder and various other kinds of dreams, you're assigned a third gender. And you are told you're a third gender. What? Why? I don't know why. That's their cultural norm. Right. I mean, why are you know, we who we are? It's, it's, it's assigned to them as part of their cultural norm. Um, I don't know why thunder and lightning dreams um, other than that's part of their spiritual world and they're part of their cosmology. But there's other things that can lead to being assigned a third gender as well um, in terms of uh, what we would potentially call schizophrenia. That is seen as being talking to the spirit world. And so if that is taken on and, and starts developing in puberty and teen years, that is seen as a special connection to the spirit world. And so that becomes um, sometimes a third gender that then also has different tasks of being a shaman. Yeah, there's a real strong connection between ritual, specializ ritual specialization and third gender. Yeah, you know, there's a strong the connection between that in many cultures. Does that help at all? Okay. <laughs> right, right. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we can get down to real brass tacks with examples on, on <laughs> the um, next topic. The next topic, which should I go ahead? Sure. All right. So one of the one of the points that that uh, we thought would be important to make is that again, any any kind of technology that groups of people are involved in, whether it's pottery making or house building or farming, there are all sorts of components to that activity that involve groups of people. And so even if, let's say, the dominant potters in your village or your culture are female, it may be that their brothers and husbands are the ones who dig up the clay and the temper and bring it back to the village. Uh, or it could be that they help with some of the polishing or they may help with uh, other aspects of the production. They may be gathering fuel for the firing. Or doing the firing. Or doing the firing. And we do see a lot of variability uh, and a lot of flexibility in, in, in uh, the genders that get involved in these sorts of activities around the world. Um, and there are interesting examples in the Southwest, and I think the best one that's under, the, best, the best documented one uh, in terms of uh, men who become involved in pottery making, in terms of pottery polishing and decorating would be uh, Julian Martinez. Um, you know, assisting his wife Maria in, um, you know, the production of the black on black wear in San Ildefonso. And, you, you know, you might, read, you might read or hear a story that uh, Nampeo from First Mesa at Hopi, that, uh, that her husband Lesso actually 
formed and polished and painted vessels, but that does not seem to be the case. It's a popular story, but researchers who've looked at it have found that, um, one, he was a really busy guy doing other stuff. He was kind of a rough, tough cowboy. Not that rough, tough cowboys can't make pottery, but he was busy running a ranch uh, most of the time and not, not around when uh, Nampea was doing a lot of her pottery making. And even though there are thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs of Nampeo and her daughters working together on pottery, there is not one single photograph of Lesso doing anything with a pot, not even holding a pot. And interviews with the descendants, uh, with that family, they all say, well, people say that, you know, great grandpa did that or grandpa did that, but he never touched pots. So it's, you know, you got to be careful, but, uh, you know, the Julian Martinez example is really, really well documented, and, and, and it's interesting. And there are a few other examples like that, but again, it's we're now into a market economy. Right. But I, I would add, and in, in going in a slightly different direction, is that as archaeologists, one, what do we mean by making a pot, right? Because there right. are all these steps. Right. And does one person take credit for that? And in the modern Pueblo world, either a person or a family takes credit for it. Right. But what does it really mean? But even on a, in a bigger level is um, in the, um, Oops, when sorry. we're digging, what are we getting at? Are we getting at the cultural reality or the cultural ideal? There are many, and these, this comes more from historical archeology, span where you, you have this ideal that people are writing when um, they're writing literature or they're writing stories or you've got the upper classes writing their letters and their discussions of how men and women should behave and how women should be you know, in the house and they should be cooking and they should be doing certain kinds of activities. But then when you look at actual historical buildings from that time period in the East and in the West, You've got women who are sometimes isolated, especially in the West, and they're hunting, they're cleaning the fields, they're helping out in all the, you know, they're building fences, um, and they're doing that because that they have to. Someone's got to do it. And so there's a cultural ideal of what men and women should be doing, but then there's the cultural reality. And as archaeologists, it's not always clear what we're getting at. We'd like to think that we're getting at the reality and that one of the things that archaeology helps with his history is that there's the historical documents, but then archaeology finds out that we contradict. But part of that is the actual data that we're looking at. So if we're looking at pottery designs or we're looking at Kiva murals, that seems like a place people would be expe expressing the ideal, not the reality. So how do we know which we're getting at whenever we're doing our interpretations? And how, and how far apart are they? How different are they, actually? Oh, and that's great. And that brings us back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of gender roles. Right. Because um, those two different kinds of um, activities might be associated with different spheres within the society. For example, Kiva murals being um, heavy-duty ritual. And um, again, I'm pushing the ethnographic record back into the past. but um, we, would, we would assume, or at least we would start from the hypothesis that that would be a realm that is led by men. Sometimes. Sometimes. Mostly. Mostly. But not always. Well, <laughs> I'm going to speak, <laughs> and so it begins. <laughs> no. It was so good till right now. No. Um, speaking from, uh, you know, from my Hopi-centric uh, um, perspective on this, uh, yes, I'm a Hopophile. I, <laughs> um, it, it, uh, even the, the heavy duty, uh, even the, the most important um, women's ritual societies at Hopi are actually headed by men. And so um, there is this, there is at Hopi at least, this very tight control of the ritual system by men, uh, even in the things that are supposed to be women's societies. Um, but where I wanted to go with this, because I think this is interesting and it relates to Pottery Mound and other things that you and I have been talking about a lot, right. and Kelly Hayes Gilpin's been talking about a lot, is um, the concept of multi-authored vessels, okay? You can have, all right, let's, the example would be Maria Martinez forms the vessel, Julian knocks out the paint, okay? That's one kind of multi-authored vessel. 
Well, it turns out when we're looking at the archaeological record, and I think Patty Crown has actually made the, the biggest contributions to this kind of research, um, we can see, those of us who spend too, way too much time looking at pottery, we can say, oh, that was... Can you spend too much time looking at pottery? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, people like us can look at the pot <laughs> and say, wow, that was formed by a really skilled potter and, and painted by a novice. Or it was, that's kind of a little clubby and made by an amateur and then painted by somebody who was really great. Or a great potter formed it and laid out the design and then it was filled in by a novice. Or, and you can see all the combinations, and we do see all those combinations. Right, we absolutely do. And what's really neat about that, to take us off a little bit off of gender, but also related to identity and roles and, and jobs is age, which is not really our main focus today, but it turns out that because there are cross-cultural regular, cross-cultural, say that five times fast, regularities in the sorts of errors that children make in doing art, that one can um, tell within a range how old the, the child was who painted a pot, which is pretty fascinating stuff. And Patty Crown has made the most of this research. It's really great stuff. Um, but and w actually, to add to that, when I was down um, at Mata Ortiz, uh, uh, I, it was explained to me, and I don't know how true this is, but I bought a pot that was made by, um, that was decorated by um, someone junior high going into high school kind of age, right, ninth grade-ish age. And it was pa painted beautifully, but they had not formed the pot. And they had said, well, they learned to decorate them before they really learned to form them. They, yeah. they work on forming them, but this individual, it had been painted by um, a child, but it, uh, it hadn't been formed by a child, that they were still working on something that they could form well enough to be able to sell it. And I don't know how true that is across the board, but it, it's sort of an anecdotal example of, right. of that. Right. Well, and, and getting back to multi-authored, though, in terms of gender, the reason that I brought this up is Kelly Hayes Gilpin, um, incredible genius who works with pottery. Brilliant. Brilliant. She's brilliant. Um, she has made arguments related to differences between decoration on the inside of the pot and decoration on the outside of the pot. And uh, this is particularly during late prehistory, in, the, in really in the 1400s and 1500s, and um, during the period of Kachina religion taking off and Kiva murals and all sorts of interesting things going on in the Pueblo Southwest. And she makes arguments, or at least hypotheses, about men painting some of the imagery mm -hmm. that's very ritually charged, because that's part of their vernacular as men in the ritual sphere. That when we see crossover between the ritual sphere and the pottery sphere, that's men being involved. And that's an interesting hypothesis. Although she's beginning to suspect that women may have painted some of the Kiva murals at Pottery Mound, but that was not taken with them when they went back to Hopi, or Indeed. went to Hopi. So there can be potential variation, and there's, especially in this period that, that Kelly and, and we are interested in, there's a lot of experimentation as well with ritual and religion and different ethnic groups trying to live together. And so any number of combinations could have been, been happening. Yeah, and one of the, there are a couple of, the, we're always, as archeologists, we're always looking for some kind of um, evidence. We're always looking for some kind of clue, you know, to help unravel a mystery. And people have done some smart things in the past. There are people who focused on fingerprints. They look at the size of fingerprints on average that you find on different kinds of pottery. And, and it turns out that in uh, the Pueblo and Southwest, in late prehistory, it, at least on corrugated pottery, which preserves fingerprints very, very well, that uh, on the Colorado Plateau, it seems that most of the pottery, corrugated pottery, was made by women because the size range would be appropriate for what we know of the size of Pueblo and women during that period of time. But um, People have looked at this in, in very, very interesting ways in terms of pottery painting, uh, in terms of the, the, not just the kind of iconography, but how, how the iconography is portrayed. If it's, in other words, if there's a subject matter that's being portrayed in the vessel, if it's a pictorial vessel that's in the women's realm, is it portrayed correctly? Is it, or is it something from the male realm? Is it portrayed correctly? These are the kinds of avenues that people have tried to explore to look at these issues of gender. Yeah, and, and looking at burial goods. Exactly. Um, which may or may not 
always work well, like we already discussed. Right. Um, I mean, if you find that a, a, a male is buried with pigments, <laughs> normally, a lot of uses for pigments. right? There's a lot of uses for pigments, so it's possible they could have been painting pottery but it's also possible they were painting Kiva murals or rock art or their bodies prayer or prayer sticks or any other number of things. And if a woman's buried with pigments, um, again, that may or may not be related to her job. And it's also, the burial goods were placed there by living people. Right. And so it may not even necessarily reflect Yeah, what probably in most cases. They, yeah, um, most cases, not always, <laughs> but, but mostly. Um, I guess theoretically you could fall in and <laughs> with your have all your stuff with you. <laughs> but but the, the burial goods are placed there by living people. And what their message was or their reasoning for providing that good, were they are they giving those goods to that individual for some reason? Or are they right. are they having some kind of social conversation with the other living people around the grave? Um, and so, you know, Interpreting burial goods um, is tricky for a variety of reasons, and that's another reason. It's not like someone said, hey, when I die, bury me with all this stuff. Um, someone decided who was around, who was alive, what to bury them with. And I think pottery is a good choice. Yeah, I think pottery is a great choice. <laughs> I wish more people were buried with more pottery. Um, um. So, so any, any questions so far? Because um, we're going to get more abstract and esoteric. <laughs> There's a hand up over there. Yeah. He's a brave soul. Is there, or do you, is there, I guess, in the literature, do you, there, do you believe Wait. that there's a correlation between multi-authorship in pottery and market economies? And, and I guess if so, then does that give us an avenue into understanding prehistoric economy in the, in the Southwest or... Wow, that's a good question. That's a really Chris. good question. Yeah, I think um, Go ahead. So it, it depends on the market economy. Um, our market economy is one, or the, the, our market economy, like I'm hanging out making pottery. I cannot make pottery. Like the only thing I can do with pottery, I can study it in all ways. The one thing I cannot do is actually, unless it's a tile. I can I make, make a really flat tile. I make really good ashtrays. Yeah, I can make a flat tile. That's it. Um, but so when... When folks in the Southwest are making pottery, it's usually for the tourist market or the art market. And that's a different market than if you're making pottery for people in your village who doesn't, doesn't have anyone in their household who makes pottery. But there's a market economy that you can specialize and make pottery for another household. Or if you're making it for a village. Or if you're making it in, in the Roman era and you have slaves making these workhouses and the pottery is being distributed all across the Mediterranean. And so there's different kinds of markets for pottery. Um, and I think depending on what those markets are um, is how much the ethnicity or the multi-authored or what that authorship even is or what it means will vary. Right. And I think, but I think that what Chris is getting at is an interesting question because when we think of, I think when we, I think when we think of, <laughs> I believe that when we consider <clears throat> pottery making um, and specialization in the Southwest, we most often think about um, that within the village specialization, but then also community specialization. Like for example, with the Hopi, okay, I gotta go back to the home team. Um, <clears throat> in late in prehistory, we know that all Jedido yellowware, all Hopi pottery, decorated pottery is being made sort of in one place and it's going in large quantities. To, to a few places and there's large scale exchange. There's large scale production, large scale exchange. Uh, and it was clearly um, a big deal. A lot of people were involved. And so you have to ask the question, what, is, what exactly is represented by these multi-authored vessels, as, as Chris is getting to? And one of the ideas that people have been exploring is that the sloppy designs on the outside are what you have the, um, uh, the novices paint when they first join the work group. And it turns out that there's some evidence to suggest that patterning in those exterior designs represent different work groups. So the nice stuff painted on the inside is by the skilled potters, and the slapdash stuff on the outside is by the apprentices, which is an interesting way to look at it. So I'm not saying that I necessarily buy that entire argument, but it's an interesting, interesting way to look at it, and there are some patterns that could be interpreted that way. So, but I think what you're getting at is labor, maybe, some way, looking at labor getting people involved in production? No, 
I was just curious if there's a I can't think off the top of my head that there's necessarily a correlation between market economy and multi-authorship. Um, but I think that apprenticeship model makes sense. But the apprenticeship model does make sense. In that context. And, and that's m mainly the way I think that Southwesterners have studied it. I'm sorry to finish your sentence. No, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> and wasn't, yeah, there's another question. Yeah, so your talk has made me think a lot about what our archaeological record would look like from this period in time when we're starting to societally accept another gender, perhaps, or another construct of that. And what, um, do you encounter that in the archeological record at all of what, of periods in time where society begins to accept another construct? So a change in, in yeah. the number of genders or the change or in gender identity? Gender identity or accepting. I mean, I mean, we think about in the hmm. past of there being, okay, this particular society looks at things this way, but they probably, you know, we're constantly going through change of how we look mm -hmm. at our society today. And so do you ever see that in the archeological record of change happening? I'm sure it's extremely oh. difficult, but. So I, I mean, part of what I look at and spend a lot of time worrying about is changes in identity, it, but mostly more like ethnic identity. And I think I do see changes in that. You may or may not buy my arguments, but I, I believe I do. I do. Um, but I don't. I have never looked for specifically changes in gender roles or gender identity. I'm trying. I'm like thinking in my head. Um, can I think of any like pull out any other studies from other people? And I'm not. Nothing's coming to mind. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Well, but I can't think of any specifically that look at that the in the one, Southwest. The one line of research that I can think of has to do again with gender roles and scheduling of tasks. Yes. So okay. sort of modeling what would be expected of males or females as a category of expectations and, and tasks and responsibilities and how that changes through time. That people have People studied. have looked at that. A and looked at how task scheduling could impact the spread of agriculture, the spread the of pottery production. Of pottery. Right, exactly. And I get, and I and I take it back. Um, it gender roles have been looked at in colonial Southwest mm -hmm. and how the presence of the Spanish changed the gender dynamic or speculated on how the gender dynamic has changed um, among different Pueblo groups um, and the, the, between the men and women of those Pueblo groups because the Spanish would often not deal with women. They dealt with men in a different way and so that puts women in this kind of background, at least when dealing with the Spanish. Um, and so there have, but I think most of those are more historical studies, not archeological studies, I think. Although or, I'm thinking of a Linda Cordell paper from a long time ago, looking at Heniceros and oh. um, looking at the, the, the degree to which Spanish enculturation right. affects gender roles in the historical archeology. span I think that's an example. And that's an example. And I know Anne Ramanovsky <coughs> has thought about it, but she hasn't published it. Because <laughs> she talked to us about it this summer. And so I know she's thought about it, but she hasn't published her thoughts on the topic. And what, she's, what she was looking at, at least when she was talking to us, is there's, there's, you've got folks living at the missions where you've got Spanish and indigenous groups um, interacting, and that, she thinks, the gender roles there were different than when you have people living out on, on um, more dispersed settlements or isolated settlements, and the gender roles on those isolated settlements are different. Um, but she hasn't really developed it. She's thinking about it a lot. She also thinks that identity, ethnic identity may vary between those two places, that the way people portray themselves with the Spanish is different than mixing and matching. And what I think is neat about that is that the archeologists who have been doing that are looking at what are the benefits to people who buy into the Spanish way of thinking and what are the costs. So it's a really rich kind of way to look at it. And, and, and an aspect that actually, when I kept asking, and when we were talking about this, one of the, <laughs> one of the things that's not in our outline that <gasps> probably, I know, so if we talk about it, it'll have to be off the cuff, um, <laughs> is power. Power is a part of gender relations. Power is a part of any social unit relations, whether it's ethnicity, um, uh, uh, religious groups, different generations, um, and gender, mm -hmm. and and power structure is definitely part of the the gendered story of the past, and those power structures change. Um, and so, and and by that, what I mean is, women 
and men may have the same gender roles, but when something happens like the Spanish showing up, the value placed upon those activities may change. So women may be doing exactly the same thing, but it's not valued the same right. way. And, um, and that's, that's another um, uh, dimension of looking at gender in the past. I have a question about the power. Uh, if you had to say... <laughs> Thanks, because that's not on the outline. I just said that. No! <laughs> if, you have, if you have Tonto Polychrome or whatever it is... Oh, I like this already. Somebody, yeah, this is going to be his. Somebody his. has to make the first design of which others copy that design. So that becomes power, whoever initiates that. So the question is, is there any way to determine who designs the first design who decides fabric, and then the rest of them copy it mm. that's an awesome question it is an awesome question go ahead patrick he said tonto that's your world <laughs> <laughs> okay then um i think Cayenta, that, yeah well, yeah well he I, was thinking Cayenta. no that's okay that's all right it's the same thing um i think that um the way that we have approached that topic, if I understand the question correctly, is to look at how much or how little um, ex design um, execution and design uh, similarity varies in particular areas. Um, I'm not sure I'm saying that well. Um, basically, um, cr again, I think about Patty Crown. Um, the way that she approached this sort of, I think, was looking at um, what she singled out in her sample of 800, almost 900 whole Roosevelt Redware vessels from all over the Southwest, which she thought probably, not, these are not exactly the words that she used, but she basically had isolated a group of pots from a, a few close by villages that seem to have been made by a group of matriarchs. Fantastically skilled potters, where if you measured the, these pots, you know, with calipers, they were, you can't tell the difference with the naked eye. You can barely measure the differences in terms of the vessel forms. So the thick wall thicknesses, things like that, the measurements, they were like they came out of a mold, but they were clearly handmade. Um, and then looking at the skill and the artistry and the execution of the designs. Um, and then comparing and contrasting um, spatially and temporally um, how other vessels look. I think that's the way that we, that, that's how she started to get at this, is innovators or people who are trendsetters, let's say. Um, um, that uh, it's really highly skilled. That's where she started her search, is looking for really highly skilled people who would be admired and looking at their very excellent work and then comparing and contrasting how other people are following or not following it. And then, and then ethnoarchaeologically, there have been studies uh, by Bill Longacre and his students looking at this sort of thing, but I'm drawing a blank right now in terms of the, the outcomes. <laughs> so, so the way I would approach that question um, and, and this may be going off in the wrong direction, but we, we have the sense of learning communities and right. we have the sense that it was probably mostly women, although we just talked about multi-authorship, but there's women painting the pottery. And so they're teaching that to the next generation of potters. And so in that sense, the power structure is generational. Right. But who decided and how they decided what was appropriate designs is not clear. Right. And the example I like is um, Sikyaki, how do you say it? I said that right, right? Yeah, right. okay. Um, and if you look at that, it shows up on woven um, items in Kiva, in Kiva murals. It shows up as part of Kiva murals. It shows up on pottery. Who was the first person to decide to make something totally asymmetrical and different? And is that gonna, you know, is that gonna fly? Um, it seems to show up on different media, even though we study pottery. Right. We know it shows up on different media. Right. Where, where was that happening first? Did it happen on pottery? And then someone said, hmm, I'm going to stick that on the kiva. Did they stick it on the kiva? And, and, and then the men are saying, hey, you, don't, you should do some like swoopy things. I, I don't know that we know. Um, and I'm, 
I mean, that would take a chronology we don't have. But if we had that chronology, right? We if, could answer if, that question. If we could answer that question, unless it's women painting the, pod, uh, the murals at Pottery Mound. I'm just saying, right? right. It could be, they could be doing the Sugiaki. Right. But, we don't, but we don't know. But I think we, it, would, it would require that kind of chronology to be able to really date where we, what media we see those in first. Yeah, and I think Deb's exactly right to focus in this thing of the power structure on like I said, the, ma the matriarchs, let's say. that It's, a, it's an age-related, skill-related. Did you call me Deb? I'm sorry, I did. The suit, <laughs> oh my god. That's not gonna be on tape, is it? It is. Oh boy. Do you know sorry, how many sorry. people do that to us? I just <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. That's the first time, isn't it? I think it is, and it was public, and on tape. Awesome. It'll be on the our YouTube bloopers reel. I'll live that down. <laughs> Never. Notice it took me like a minute to notice. <laughs> Sorry, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> but does that answer your question? I think, I think we can't get at it with the chronology we have, but I think it would be possible to get at it. But what we see on pottery shows up in other media as well, and how that, the, who, who decides that is not always clear. Okay, there was another question. There's a couple over this way. You like call me Jeff now. Okay. <laughs> If you jump across the ocean, go back several thousand years, Ramesses II is always shown as having female hips. Have you heard that? All the statues- I of have. Him, yeah, he has a female <coughs> lower half, and yet he's allegedly fathered a lot of kids, you know, or he found <laughs> somebody to father them. But it doesn't seem to be something he was ashamed of because all the statues show him that way. He could have had the statues changed, so. That's another interesting gender situation. Yeah, and I think the, the gender situation as we understand it in Egypt, their roles are somewhat different. There's actually, going back to the discussion of um, archeology span of sexuality, there's um, an article that discusses that mm -hmm. and, and sexuality in ancient Egypt. Um, and, and that sort of playing with gender among the pharaohs, um, both you know, women having fake beards that's women true. pharaohs yeah. having like, fake like beards, headshots. right? That's exactly. What I was just say. And right. so, um, right. but when I was talking earlier about the whole notion <laughs> of the difference between a third gender, and 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 this is a tricky concept to get your head around, but the uh, and and I struggle verbalizing it. But the difference between a third gender and someone who has male and female attributes. Um, this is something that we see in Mesoamerica. There are third right. gender in Mesoamerica, but then there's also gods and priests and chiefs or leaders who seem to incorporate both male and female attributes and the pharaohs could be viewed as this way and so it's, and it's more, a divine thing it's a divine thing and it's a power thing like we don't need the other half we are both right, right. and that's different than the sexuality and third gender um, but when we do see that kind of attribute it is usually more of a power structure and a divine structure that we are both we don't need the other half right and, and, and that was, I was thinking about that after the, um, dis, uh, Gilman's discussion about the, the, the twin that has sometimes has fem feminine oh, qualities. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the hero twins. The hero twins. Which and, is a and the younger thing. brother. And that's a pottery thing. We should fill them in, though. <laughs> so be, those of you who weren't at the Southwest Symposium, <laughs> Pat Gilman uh, gave a great talk about um, really compelling evidence that the Mesoamerican hero twins, or the, the southwestern version would be the warrior twins, saga that, go, that is you know, recorded in the Maya Popol Vuh actually shows up in complete form with great detail on Mimbra's pottery. And as, as Seuss um, yes, Jeff. <laughs> mentioned, <laughs> um, the uh, the younger it is the younger twin. It's the younger the twin. The younger twin is often depicted uh, with uh, either items of female clothing or other indicators that there's a there's there are female aspects of that identity. But it but also male aspects. But also male aspects. And and it's again in this divine context. But it's right. And that's the twin actually who becomes the moon, which then you know controls women's cycles and that side of thing. And so it's, that's an interesting aspect of that as well, that, that eventually rises to the heavens and becomes the moon. So, um. uh, so other than that, that's a nice specific example showing almost an androgyny. 
Mm -hmm. What would be an example of what you would find or what you would see that would indicate to you that someone had changed or was together as opposed to just being female? I'm not exactly. You know, if, if I made a pot and my lesbian friend made a pot and my homosexual male f friend made a pot, how would you know which one was which? Because you're talking about how people change over and how they have different well, attributes. But you're talking about sexuality there. A well, lesbian I'm, can still be a female. So like, it's a poor example, but you know what I'm saying is how do you tell the difference? Well, Kelly Hayes Gilpin, um, and one of my favorite examples of how you tell the difference, is um, the, the, the line, the rim line on pottery, or some pottery. Um, uh, uh, sometimes a rim line has a break in it. And she has argued that that break, uh, if, if that's a lifeline, that that break was painted by either third gender, male, so someone who's infertile, or menopausal women who, again, could be considered a different gender because they're no longer fertile. And so she uses that example of pottery as being painted by a different third gender. Um, she, I think she uses um, ethnographic data for that. Do you know where mm -hmm. that data yeah, comes from? I, well, and the idea is that, well, again, this is where we're pushing ethnographic right, data. Right, but I, th I think that's where it comes from. I don't remember off the top of my head. But her specific example is, is Hopi pottery that, that looks exactly like early historic period Hopi pottery and practices of early histo historic Hopi pottery, but just back right before the Spanish. So in her case, it's a... It's, yeah, it's a very specific it's case. It's a very specific case. And, and, and what it has to do with is the symbolism of the line break, perhaps uh, representing um, fertility and uh, the uterus, basically. Right. Um, and... Um, I guess another example, what, what kind of what I was getting at earlier, again, individuals are very hard to deal with in the archaeological record. Um, the way that people do tend to do that sort of thing, uh, they can get at some aspects of like insider, outsider, looking at brush strokes and fine details, but I don't think that you could necessarily get to... To gender To gender, that. but getting back to what I was talking about earlier, if you know enough about the society or you can surmise, you can hypothesize enough about what which genders would normally be associated with individual tasks and which knowledge bases would be available to those groups of people. And you see a lack of understanding of the basic knowledge base being executed on an artifact. Let's see, again, you see male information depicted completely incorrectly or female information depicted just mistakenly. Um, then th there are people who have used that to make arguments. The, okay. the one thing that archaeologists have learned, though, from that sort of approach is to try and remember that if you're dealing with pottery or some other kind of pictorial medium, that license has to be taken so that the people who view that can actually understand what they're seeing. And som sometimes, you know, you think about perspective and you think about uh, depicting things in a way that make it easy to understand what's going on that might not necessarily represent reality. So it's a, it's a hard thing. And, and another aspect or another way we could tell is may not be, oh, this actual pot was painted by someone who was third gender, but in some Mesoamerican um, examples, uh, looking at their iconography where you, you see people, uh, specifically there are certain kinds of hair designs and certain kinds of clothing that you would have that uh, is either male or female and then, or man or woman, and then you get certain individuals who have one hairstyle but a different clothing style, or vice versa, or they That's have half hair example. and half hair. And That's those people example. are doing certain activities. Right. And so we may not be able to say, well, um, a third gender made this pot, but we can say third genders were making pot. We're doing this kind of stuff. Right. And that's a great example. I mean, when you, when you understand the gender specific depictions of how normal people are going to look on pottery within a culture that is huge. Right. For example, one of the ways that you can spot a Kachina depiction on ancient Hopi pottery, uh, if, it's, if it's executed in the way where you don't get the facial features, you can see the combination of the unmarried woman's hairstyle, but with a married woman's sash. Humans don't do that, but Kachinas do. So, um, again, I'm Go back to the home team. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? We have a question way in the back. Okay. 
And interestingly enough, as you probably know, Katsinam, regardless of which gender um, is, is being depicted with the regalia, they are personified all by men, interestingly enough. Yeah. And they mix. But that's not a cross gender, right? No. That's not a man woman. It's a male personifying a, a female, female spirit. A spirit. Right. And so again, that's another example. It's the divine. Yeah, it's, it's another example of the rules don't really work because it's the divine. Right. So the question I have, I've, I've uh, heard by some anthropologists in New Mexico that they've seen that ritual pottery is very often very poorly rendered, and the idea was it was the guys who were in charge of the ritualism, but they were really not very accomplished painters. Is that something that you also see in, can uh, speculate in the archeological record? Yes, in some instances. Well, and Kelly Hayes Gilpin has made some of these right. arguments as well, yeah. looking at Hopi pottery specifically. And, uh, and then looking ethnographically at what shows up in ritual contexts, it's often not really nice pottery that shows up in ritual contexts. It's really kind of clubby stuff. But I would argue that our society makes ritual separate from everything else. That's true. That's and a good point. It's compartmentalized. It's compartmentalized. And we don't know if it was or if it was how it was compartmentalized in the past. And so, you know, ritual, secretive ritual in Akiva is different than ritual of coming of age ceremonies, uh, public dances in the plazas. And pottery was the Tupperware of the past, right? And right. so they're using it in all these contexts. And there may be certain contexts that special pottery is made specifically for that ritual. There may be other contexts where pottery is being used and then reused for certain ceremonies or rituals. But um, we have this tendency to call things ritual when we don't know what it is. But there's probably lots of cases on daily life where ritual was happening or ceremony was happening or superstition or you know, uh, regular activities that are related to the divine that we aren't recognizing or we aren't thinking about as ritual because we're thinking about it as eating a meal. Um, and you know, we call feasting feasting, but feasting is also a ritual kind of activity. And so, yes, I think there probably was, I actually think men probably were painting pottery potentially for very specific male activities, including ritual, but I do think that there's also probably ritual pottery that was painted by women. And now, Bob, <laughs> <laughs> we've been told we're done. We're out of time. Really? Yeah. But we, we're like right here. I know. We'll give him homework. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're good? All right. All right. Are there any more questions? <laughs> Over here. Can you associate uh, the making of petroglyphs with a gender? Wow. <sighs> yes. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs> you know, I, uh, the way that I would approach that question is that that challenge would be the same way that we've, we've approached it with pottery. We would we would try. What archaeologists do all the time is try to weave weave an, uh, a, a believable argument together based on uh, uh, cross-cultural regularities, specific ethnographic evidence, um, and uh, the nature of the depiction, and, um, and the location of the depiction. And the location, and what we know of the context. Right. I think those are the, and then, yeah. The, so, I mean, I think one could make arguments. I, I would not myself, because it's not well, made so out of clay. Well, I mean, there's like, there, <laughs> right, yes. I, know, I don't think about it, it's not pottery. Um, but. So I think having given rock art some thought in grad school, because it was my TA ship or my RA ship, I had to think about it. Um, I think that there's, there's probably specific panels that you could make an argument for one way or the other, um, but I don't know that you could do it for all rock art or all panels. Right. Uh, and so I think, I think it's, it's possible, but I think it's gonna depend on the panel. Yeah, and to smear Kelly Hayes Gilpin again, <laughs> Um, she has a great book called Ambiguous Images mm -hmm. that's a lot that's on this topic of gender and rock art and um, 
I think one of the places where she makes the most convincing arguments is where she does exactly what I've been doing all night, which is going to the Hopi Mesas. <laughs> and um, I know, it's, it's been working for me for a long time. Um, and uh, what she does is she, she actually has an entire chapter on maidenhood and on the transition uh, to being uh, a maiden, a marriageable young woman at Hopi and, and um, how a lot of the symbolism that is extant today goes back in the rock art for more than a thousand years. And um, that uh, you can make sense of that, those panels in that context and everything is explained. And it matches explanations that you would get from, from Hopi people today and it matches what you'd see in the, in the ethnographic record. But again, it's specific, it's specific very, panels. very specific, where you go, oh, it's, it's kind of like the Hero Twins story. You go, oh, God, that's the Popol Vu. That's when you're really on to something. I think if you don't have that kind of anchor where you, have, you can go, well, you can start a hypothesis. Well, if this really is the Popol Vu, then I should see this twin and that twin, and then I should see this uncle and this event, and oh, there's the monster bird, and there's when the head, the decapitation happens, and that's when this one becomes okay. the moon. There are those sorts of formulas in Hopi oral tradition and Hopi uh, ritual where she's able to see those in rock art. But again, it's very, very it's specific. It's a very specific situation. Okay, I think that's going to wrap it up for tonight. Um, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much for having us. Um,